Thank you very much. Um, so the title of my presentation is uh, a bit misleading, maybe, uh, on nature and the universe in the uh, Tokugawa period, especially this part, because I'm not actually going to talk about nature and the universe directly. Um, I mean, the main focus of my research uh, has been for the, uh, for the past couple of years the concept of nature in Japan, uh, whether it's Shizen or Jinen or um, whatever you, might, uh, you want to call it. Um, and <coughs> I've been looking into the works of philosophers like, um, especially pre-modern philosophers, like uh, Ando Shoeki, for example, and uh, Yamagata Banto, and so on and so forth. And today I am going to talk a bit about uh, Ando Shoeki and Yamagata Banto, but I will not focus on what they say in, the, in their works, um, but on the, on the discourse that they have, on the way in which they, uh, they uh, construct, they structure their argument and, uh, and their discourse on uh, nature and the, and the universe. Uh, so, but before I start with uh, Ando Shoeki and uh, Yamagata Banto, just a short uh, preamble to my uh, presentation. Um, <clears throat> in, um, there's, of course, this uh, question of what is philosophy, what is Japanese philosophy, uh, what is the discourse, what is the typical discourse in, in uh, Japanese philosophy. And I've been thinking a lot about this uh, lately, um, and uh, that's why I'm starting with this, uh, actually, with this uh, preamble, um, by referring to um, a uh, book by a French philosopher, Pierre Adot, uh, which was first published in 1981 in the uh, French edition, and then there's also an English edition which was published in 95 or 96, something like that, um, who says that um, he's trying to uh, clarify his stance on what he understands by philosophical discourse. And he says that uh, philosophers have constantly made use of several other modes of discourse and practices besides uh, rational argumentation. So his idea is that rational argumentation, as we have it in, uh, in the Greco-European um, tradition, is not the only mode of discourse. Uh, and he, he gives examples of other forms of uh, discourse, and he cites uh, the dialectical, the exegetical, and the systematic as being the, uh, the most uh, representative. The exegetical, for example, means engaging uh, with the fundamental texts uh, in a certain, um, of a certain philosopher or in a, in a certain tradition, um, commenting on those texts and so on and so forth. The systematic is uh, the systematic The systematic uh, form of discourse is the systematic presentation of one's doctrine, and uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, his conclusion is that um, <clears throat> well, he uh, he starts his uh, argument from the uh, from the ancient Greeks, uh, and he says that for the ancient Greeks, um, it, philosophy was rather as a, a, a way of life. It should be understood as a way of life. It when you do philosophy, it changes the whole way, uh, your whole way of, uh, of life. It's not just a dry practice focusing on rational argumentation as the only uh, kind of discourse. And um, <coughs> adding to that, um, there's a, um, a comment, a commentary by uh, Professor Meraldo, who um, cites uh, Ado. And um, the, um, the comment is that in doing so, Ado actually, what he does is to open up the scope of what we call philosophy to accommodate non-Western traditions as well. Uh, and uh, there are a few examples there, like Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, uh, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, there's another quote uh, from a book that was published in 2016. Um, by an American philosopher, Smith. Um, the, the book is about uh, the six types of philosophers, but in the introduction, uh, Smith tries to uh, clarify, uh, again, his um, understanding of philosophy. And he says that, um, the quote is, uh, is a bit long, but I, I think it's important, the question whether the activity of philosophy is, we, we must ask ourselves this question, uh, the, uh, whether the activity of philosophy is coextensive with the term, that is, whether it is only those activities that have been explicitly carried out under the banner of uh, philosophia that are to be considered philosophy, or whether there are uh, also analogical practices and cultures that have evolved independently of the culture of ancient Greece that can also be called by the name uh, philosophy. Um, so <coughs> is, 
in a nutshell, he's saying the same thing as uh, Ado, that not um, only those practices that we are used to or we have called philosophia or philosophy, but that we should look into other forms of uh, discourse uh, as well. And um, this is where I, uh, I start my, uh, <coughs> my research. If Ado's proposition, if uh, Moraldo's commentary, if uh, Smith's uh, understanding of philosophy, if they're correct, then how do these modes of discourse, uh, the dialectical, for example, or the systematic, how do they uh, appear? How do they function, for example, in what we call Japanese philosophy, in pre-modern, let's say, pre-modern Japanese philosophy, and what is their role? Uh, and um, today I'm going to talk about, as I was saying, two Tokugawa period philosophers, Ando Shoeki and uh, Yamagata Vanto, and I'm going to try and see how um, the <clears throat> their discourse is structured and how it works uh, in, in this framework that um, Ado suggests. So first of all, just a couple of things about Ando Shoeki and then uh, his discourse. His main uh, work is titled uh, Shizen Shin Edo, which has been translated in a, in a variety of ways. It's the, uh, the way of nature, the uh, functioning of the way of nature, and so on and so forth. Um, <coughs> in a nutshell, uh, Shizen Shin Edo, um, in, 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 this, in his um, Shizen Shin Edo, uh, Shoiki puts forth this vision of the world in which you have two opposing realms. Uh, in the first one is the so-called Shizen no Yo, or Shizen Se, as he calls it sometimes, which is the world of nature, and which represents uh, a pristine realm, a primordial uh, realm. And uh, as such, it's opposed to what he calls Shiho Se, the world of uh, private law, which basically uh, refers to uh, human society. Uh, because his, his idea is that uh, human society in a way represents a, a sort of lapse, uh, a fall from this uh, world of nature, which was caused by the creation, by the invention uh, of the laws, the whole. Uh, and when he says laws, he means by that any doctrine. Uh, he includes there Confucianism, Buddhism, and so on and so forth. So he criticizes um, the, the world of law uh, <clears throat> because it's, uh, um, he uses the term shiho because he says these laws, they're actually just self-serving uh, laws. Uh, now, what he does when he presents his uh, vision of the, of the world with the two, uh, uh, with the two different realms, um, at a certain point in, in the book, it's not an appendix. It's not at the end of the book. It's not in the beginning, so it's not like uh, an introduction. But it's just smack middle in the, uh, in, in the, text, in, in, in the text. He has several parables and uh, fables um, that are considered uh, by Tucker, for example, to be of uh, Taoist uh, inspiration, like uh, Zhuang Zhu's uh, parables, for example. And these parables, at first sight, they appear as an anomaly. They're not, they're different uh, from the, there are a lot of incongruities there. The style is different. The wording is different. Uh, they're parables. There, there's a story there. So he's not just um, exposing his idea his ideas uh, in, in the parables as in uh, the rest of the text. Um, so they represent a, a stylistic and uh, discursive um, incongruity. Uh, for example, in, in, in the parables, what happens there is uh, you have the four, he considers that there are four types of um, creatures or animals in the, uh, in the world. Uh, they're the, the birds, the, the fishes, the various kinds of fish, uh, the uh, <clears throat> Crawling creatures, and I forget the fourth one, I'm sorry, uh, I remember, oh, I'm sure. Uh, and um, crawling creatures, that also includes uh, snakes, for example. Um, but not only snakes, also bugs and uh, all kinds of insects and so on and so forth. And what happens in, in these parables is that all these cre uh, creatures, they gather, and they have this sort of uh, general meeting, universal uh, meeting, where everybody's present, and they start to discuss the world of law. The crawling creatures, for example, they're part of the world of nature. Um, that's their uh, way of being. And they start to criticize the world of law in these, um, the human, human society in these uh, meetings that they, that they have. And sometimes you have, um, how do I put this? Not, um, um, not, um, I'm not sure how to 
phrase this, uh, sometimes the, the language that they use is informal. It's uh, a bit dirty. Uh, I mean, they talk about venereal diseases, for example. Uh, in, in, in the parable of the birds, they start making fun of one of the birds. Uh, I think it's the swan, who is a very beautiful bird, uh, but is plagued by some diseases. And, and this is not your regular kind of uh, philosophical discourse. Um, to give just an, uh, an, uh, two examples, you have a quote here for, uh, from the, uh, the parable of the, the corn creatures. Uh, my question was, why, why does Shoiki do that? Why, what's the function, what's the role that these parables have? Uh, so here's the quote from the parable of the uh, crawling creatures. He says, uh, this is um, the creatures uh, talking among them. Um, Therefore, the hierarchy of human society, where big devour small, and the hierarchy of our world, where big devour small, are exactly the same. And so it is that the actions of human beings in human society are no different from the actions of crawly creatures in their world. It's obvious that his, uh, the, the crawly creatures in the world of nature, they criticize um, <clears throat> human society. There's another quote uh, from the parable of the fishes. Uh, this is actually at the end of the parable. Uh, and I feel that in this fragment, Shoiki is um, his expressing his um, intention. Uh, he's telling us why he wrote this uh, the whole book, not only the parables, he says, my description of the worlds of the four types of creatures is not motivated by hatred for human society, but by the sadness at the great difference between the true way of nature and the self-serving laws um, in human society, and at the fact that human beings are unaware of that difference. So these are just a couple of uh, quotes from, from, the, um, from the parables. Um, <coughs> and. Uh, there are, for example, in, in, in the parable of the, of the crawling uh, creatures, where he says that uh, where big devours small the uh, hierarchy of human society, where he, the part where he talks about the hierarchy of, of human society, that's a, a, a reference to what he had already said in the, in the main uh, body of, uh, of text of, uh, of his uh, Shizen Shin Edo, is a self-quote, self-reference uh, to a certain extent, if you want. Um, so this is, um, the, my, my question was, why are these parables there? Why do they uh, appear there? Why does Shoeki choose to, um, to include them in, uh, in his work? That was my, my first question. And uh, keeping that in mind, I'm going to move on to uh, the second thinker that I want to talk about, um, which, who is uh, Yamagata Banto. Uh, just a couple of things about him. Um, he's not um, <coughs> not a big, very famous um, philosopher, but uh, he's important for um, for two reasons. Uh, first of all, he was one of the most important promoters of uh, rangaku studies, uh, Dutch studies in uh, in the Osaka area. Uh, and uh, the second reason is, I, I would say, his Yume no Shiro, his uh, encyclopedic work, which he completed in uh, 1820, just one year before, uh, before his death. Uh, he studied Confucianism uh, at the Kaito Kudo, the merchant school in Osaka, which is considered to be uh, um, the beginning of Osaka University. And he also studied uh, astronomy, he also studied Zerangaku, and so on and so forth. Uh, what's interesting about Yamagata Banto, I've just started looking into, uh, into his work, and uh, it's so diverse and so, uh, there's so much uh, in, in there. But what I find interesting is that, for example, uh, he criticizes the eto, the sexagenary uh, cycle. He says this is just a superstition. It doesn't work. Things don't work like that in the world. Uh, he criticizes Kojiki and Shoki, <coughs> and he also criticizes Motori Norinaka's interpretation of the, uh, of the text. Uh, of the text, he says, um, there is uh, basically what he's saying is that there is no God. So the stories that you have in Kojiki and Nihon Shoki cannot be true, since there are no gods that uh, come down from heaven. And uh, he also criticizes uh, Buddhism and uh, Confucianism. Uh, and he's uh, sometimes he's considered to be like one of the first atheists, uh, atheist philosophers in uh, in Japan. Um, but. <clears throat> In going back to uh, Yume no Shiro, his first, um, <coughs> his, his major work, um, this is actually um, a, a very um, 
diverse as I was saying. It's a, it's a very diverse uh, work. It's like a patchwork where he has, um, for example, he talks about, uh, he exposes his own vision of the solar system, but at the same time he talks about Confucianism and he criticizes uh, Motori Norinaga and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's like a, a real uh, puzzle. Um, I'm going to focus just on the part where he talks about the, the solar system, which is the part that was influenced, apparently, by uh, a work uh, by William Whiston, who was uh, one of Newton's disciples, who has a, a book, who published in 1696, a book which was called um, A New Theory of the Earth from its Original to the Consummation of All Things, and so on and so forth. The title is really long and uh, really interesting. Uh, the book, uh, Whiston's book, was translated in Japanese, uh, by Hashimoto Sokichi, who was uh, another Rangaku scholar, and apparently um, Yamagata Banto had access to the to the book, read it, and was influenced by uh, Whiston's vision of the of the solar system. Uh, this is the full, actually, the full title of uh, Whiston's uh, book, and as you can see, it's a new theory of the Earth from its original to the consummation of all things, wherein the creation of the world in six days, the universal deluge, and the general conflagration, as laid down in the holy scriptures are shown to be perfectly agreeable to reason and philosophy. This is beautiful. You have to, <laughs> it's like, relig you have religion and philosophy reconciled in, in, in this book. But, um, Whiston's uh, theory is that, uh, so this is his uh, um, drawing, his diagram of the, of the solar system, and his theory is like, uh, he, he talks about a, a um, <clears throat> cometary catastrophe, he, he says that, the, uh, the beginning of the world, the beginning of the universe, was actually uh, caused by uh, a couple of comets that just came flying into uh, the, the solar system. I guess this is his way of reconciling uh, religion and philosophy, maybe. But he uses wisdom in, in, in his book. Uh, he uses uh, drawings like this, uh, one that you have uh, here, uh, very uh, with the planets and the the orbits of the of the various planets and and, and so on and so forth. And if you look into um, Yamagata Banto's book, you also find, I'm sorry the reproduction is not very good, but you also find uh, the, the kind of the, the same uh, layout of the uh, of the solar universe. Of course, Wiston may not be the the only influence, but as far as we know, it's uh, the only text that Yamagata Banto uh, had uh, access to, and. Uh, he goes even further, he says, uh, if you look at this, there's a, a short explanation there. He, he talks about people living on other planets um, in, uh, in his uh, vision of the, of the solar system. Uh, and he also creates all these, uh, he, he gives details about, uh, <coughs> about all the stars. And he, he talks about uh, a, a part of the universe that is always in the dark and another part that is always in the light, and, and, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to go into, uh, into details. Uh, my question was, in Ando Soiki's case and in uh, Yamagata Banto's case, why do they do this? Why does Soiki use the parables? Why does um, <clears throat> Yamagata Banto make use of all these diagrams and drawings of the, uh, of the universe? It's like words were not enough for them. And, um, I started thinking about the status that these parables and fables and uh, diagrams and illustrations have in the um, in their discourse, um, and they make rather, uh, especially Banto, he makes rather extensive use of these uh, of these di diagrams, and are they mere appendices to the text? Is there um, a body, a main body of text that these parables or diagrams were just later on attached? Uh, to, or are they an integral part of the uh, of the text of the of the philosophical uh, discourse? My conclusion for now is that uh, all all these the the fables the the diagrams and so on and so forth um, they constitute in fact an integral uh, part of the text a sine qua non uh, part of the of the philosophical discourse in both cases both for uh, Andrzejewski and for. Yamagata Banto. Um, as I said, in Andoshoiki's parables, for example, you find a lot of references to his previous uh, discourse, and you also have uh, a couple of fragments where he announces what he is going to write after that. I think probably, probably, he, he, he does not talk about this, uh, but probably it's a way of um, emphasizing his point. That's why he uses, uh, he makes use of all these parables. That's one possibility. And another possibility is the fact that he's actually using a mode of expression uh, which was familiar 
for his readers, for him, uh, for the uh, for his disciples, for example, they knew all these um, um, Taoist uh, parables, and he's trying to express, convey his ideas through another, uh, through this uh, method as well, uh, and. I think uh, that this is my uh, partial conclusion for now. I think that uh, we can uh, include um, these uh, types of discourse um, in 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 uh, Hado, in Ado, Pierre Ado's uh, frame. Um, they're probably <coughs> part of the systematic, maybe. They're exp uh, ways in which. Uh, Shoiki and Yamagata Bando try to uh, convey their message systematically. Um, and um, in other words, what is apparently non-philosophical, like the, the diagrams or, or the Taoist parables, can sometimes be uh, philosophical and integ an integral part of a, um, of a philosophical discourse. And I'm out, out of time, and I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. 21 minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe uh, just one point. Have you thought that even uh, philosophy, the Greek philosophy, uses uh, analogies, uh, you know, to to as part of like Plato, primarily thinking. <coughs> to you know, so I think that shouldn't be uh, an obstacle to, to describe something as philosophy. And I think it would be interesting to maybe make to to go back to say that even at the origins of Western thought, it hasn't always been just you know, words and logical structure and so on. Maybe it can, you know, help your point. Yes, thank you very much for, for the comment. Actually, I, I forgot to say that. But yeah, uh, mm, what struck me uh, with these two thinkers, and probably there are others as well, and I'm just starting to dig into this, is that um, the way in which they, they do this is, is a bit, the, the way in which they construct their, they structure their discourse is a bit different from other philosophers of, of the time. In, in Tokugawa period, Japan. So uh, yes, um, I think a comparison with the with the Greeks uh, would be really interesting and telling. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, I'm uh, surprised with the question by your way of putting here, as you put into one sentence, parables, fables, illustrations, diagrams. Uh, I guess in part because I come from landscape architecture, architecture where we think a lot with illustrations and diagrams and we don't consider them as you know, just a, an appendix to the thinking. It's really an integral part of the thinking and there is a lot of debate now in this discipline in how to integrate these into research, into what is officially recognized as research. Uh, so I, I'm just... I would like just to ask you about how you put them in one line, or do you consider them as working differently within the uh, philosophical discourse? Um, like parables and fables, which rely on words, and the illustrations, which rely on drawings, and uh, probably yes, well, probably there are differences there. I, I just haven't had the the time to look into that. But probably yes, they, they do work. And probably the impact that they have is uh, is a bit different. If if we, if you think about the, the length of the work, for example, in in Shoiki's case, the parables, he has four parables, and uh, each one of them is of considerable length. Um, it goes on for dozens of pages, uh, so it, it occupies a, a a big chunk of of, of the text. But in um, Yamagata Banto's case, where he uses the illustrations, uh, he just had it, it's just maybe half a page, and then there's a bit of text about the, uh, the illustration, the, the space, the physical space they occupy within the work is actually smaller. So yes, I, I think there probably are differences there, and they obviously make different choices, um, but that would probably be the, the next step. I still haven't time to, to look into that. Maybe part of this is that at some point it became easier to reproduce illustrations, so people started to use it. Yes, I think so. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you. Did you think that uh, some kind of a theory of myth can help you with this uh, 
different <coughs> because when you use parables and fables, there is some like a, a literature form that so uh, that we invented in Europe. Uh, that comes some animals have a moral. I'm not sure if a theory of myth that could help to have uh, another interpretation about the histories. Because you have all in, and when you say about a, a Plato now about an parable, it's, it's just we have this discussion. It's not at all. They try uh, and they start and on Heidegger try to use Plato. Uh, we have the philosophical way with the logos, but we have all another form to think in this form to tell a history. You tell it as the myth. And then you say parable, you maybe just chum take this kind of history in some kind of prison, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or that maybe that I'm more a theory of myth, more anthropology, ethnology, and this game that clarify how is the function from the history. Thank you. Uh, I haven't thought about that, I have to confess. Um, I'll look into it. Uh, I tried to stay away from myth or any um, my, my focus was, as I was saying, on the concept of nature and Shoiki's understanding of nature and um, how he um, how he focuses on the reading Shizen and so on and so forth. Uh, so I, I haven't really tried to uh, to use this uh, framework of interpretation for for the parables, uh, but it might be worth doing. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, when it comes from the from the first case and about the theory of myth, actually, for what I know, in a different context, which is Haikai, but actually, people were discussing a lot about Uben, and especially like that fables, literally, and how they were a way to convey some truths. So that was especially on how Japanese culture in Egypt period was uh, like inheriting a lot of Taoist discourse, especially Zhuangzi. And it's relevant that how they were trying so hard to focus on nature, like to do these like natural states, and in order to talk about the state of nature, so something we don't really know, something which is beyond our like, factual understanding of reality, then we can use imagination. Then it's like we don't we don't just go and observe animals, we make fables out of them. And there was what I know, there's a um, or some research about literature and like with the concept of movement. So they were developing actually a little before some theories of uh, fables. But for the second part, I mean, I, so I absolutely agree on the, on the first section. But the, the second one, I mean, how do you differentiate that sort of illustrations? Like I said, there are, there's a philosophical meaning in the image. But how do, you, how do you differentiate it, for instance, from a, a de-illustration to a scientific text? So it seems to me actually to be at least hybrid. Yeah. So it's, the, point is that, the point is that it, has, it wants to be a representation, um, like uh, some subsidiary form to the text, and not, uh, which was actually full also in the... Uh, European films, I think Bruno, for instance, is writing a lot of diagrams, uh, but it doesn't seem to be uh, a sort of reflection. Maybe some impressions, yeah, sure, but well, especially if he was influenced by the, the sort of Western sources. I mean, yeah, there's a lot yeah, of text yes. going with the images, but it's not, I mean, it has some philosophical potential, I agree, but let's think about, there's an Asian tradition with mantras, with yantras. And mandalas, those are images which are also a sort of philosoph or philosophy. But to me, the, the, how do you differentiate? Do you have a way? Do you, do you... Not yet. <laughs> Not yet, yes. Um, it's just, it, it, it's still work in progress. Um, so I, I, I need to look in, in, into that. Uh, what struck me was the fact that both. Um, Shoiki and Yamagata Banto, um, they, uh, they come up with their own vision of, of the universe and they construct their whole discourse around that vision of, of the world of the, of the universe. Um, and um, in that discourse, they make use of uh, various peripheral elements, if you want, like the, the parables or the uh, illustrations. Um, but I never thought of looking into um, 
for example, it might be interesting to look yes into uh, scientific texts of the time and try to see how illustrations were uh, were included. And yes, it might be. Yeah, he, um, uh, Yamagata Bando, he, he um, in includes these uh, drawings of the universe w uh, when he engages, for example, with the, uh, the myths, the uh, Kojiki and uh, Nihon Shoki, the fundamental texts, where he says that if the solar system is like this, it looks like this, there can be no gods. Uh, so in, 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 in a way, it is part of his, uh, of his philosophical discourse. So I think we have one last question. Um, can we say that you read ideas of Shamisen, Shamisen, uh, Shumisen theory? You read the uh, kind of uh, this theory of astronomy. It was very accept accepted in that of the Galatea. Because I think you, you said that Banto was <coughs> trying to criticize Buddhism and it so the in Shumisen theory, we can we can easily find the illustrations, diagrams, or it's kind of a, somehow it's a traditional way of explaining the universe. So I I it seems that there was some influence on Shumisen. It could be. Yeah, there there might be. I don't know that. Yes. I don't know that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. But yeah, uh, the. Um, the thing about uh, Shoiki and Banto, again, both of them, they, they do this. Um, they study Confucianism, they study Buddhism, they're uh, well versed in Taoism, for example, but then they, they criticize us. They, they, they criticize all these uh, doctrines and say, Shoiki goes to the extreme of saying that none of them is good, just my vision of the world is, is it, this is the right one. Uh, but at the same time, whether they do it consciously or not, it's... Um, Another, another issue, but at the same time, when they criticize Buddhism, they use Buddhist elements, or they use Taoist elements, or they use Confucianist elements, so the influences are very strong, even though they criticize uh, the, those systems. So, in, uh, I think in Yamagata Banto's case, it, it might be the, the, the same kind of situation where you have, he actually uses Buddhist elements. Maybe he's not aware of them, but he uses them to, to criticize Buddhism. I think that's something that humans from the 21st century can learn with them about studying something before criticizing it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's okay. So, I would like to thank once again Roman and uh, Christina for. Thank you.